Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Our guests and our, our school uh, administrators and teachers, and thank you for coming tonight. We're going to first of all stand up and salute the flag. Salute the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just to uh, remind everybody, uh, this. Our program is uh, November 5th, and it's being uh, filmed by the Western Media Center. We have uh, Adam Corey as our new photographer up here. Thank you, Adam, for joining us. <laughs> I'd uh, like to start off here with our superintendent's report. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to add an issue to the superintendent's report at the outset, which is the situation at the middle school that we experience today. Um, so unfortunately, as you know, we had to close school at the middle school today because we had a, um, an issue with a pipe that resulted in some um, flooding on the first floor. Uh, the good news is that we, we think the situation was relatively contained to com compared to what it might have been. Um, and we're happy to report that at this point, Service Master has been in, the water's been removed, the industrial strength dehumidifiers are running overnight, and we have every reason to expect that school will be open on time tomorrow. Um, so I want to thank Ken Aries, who is our Director of Operations, and the entire operations <coughs> staff. This was a rough um, way to start a, a Monday morning at 6 a.m., but they worked diligently and quickly to contain the problem and um, Things again. So, so. It, was it an issue of just the age of the, the pipes? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we can chalk it up to that. Um, so yeah. it was a, a pipe, um, it was the cap on a pipe that's in the ceiling above the girls' room on the first floor, and it just gave out. Um, and it took a while to track down where the water was coming from. And some stroke of luck, the water largely then ran sort of you know, low ground into the elevator shaft and ended up going down into the basement rather than spreading across into the other um, section of the, the building. So that was, uh, that well, was we lucky. We do a good job of preventive maintenance of yes. our buildings, but these are 70 year old buildings that be getting mm -hmm. to uh, things uh, yeah. that have to be watched like that. So. This was in the original part of the, of the building. Yeah. So, yes. Well, thanks, Ken, and your team of people for doing all your work. Thank you. And we're just trying to keep Mr. Redmond on his toes. Here, here, we, we want him to feel challenged, so we don't throw that out there. Yeah. Yes, it does, it does not. Um, next, I'm just going to turn it over to Abby for a minute. She's going to update us on the life threatening allergies protocol work. Yep. So as you guys recall, we have a group of folks working on uh, life threatening allergy guidelines. So you guys took care of the policy and then directed us to do, develop guidelines. So we've had two meetings with about eight people that represent both parents, school folks, and um, other ancillary kind of pieces of the puzzle. If you think about food services, transportation, right? Heath and I sit on the group together. Um, and we were going to wrap it up and bring it to you tonight, but they decided they'd like to have a third meeting this month because it turns out it's a very complicated issue. And depending on how deep we want to go, we need to make sure that everybody on the committee feels heard, responded to, and that they've had a voice. And so we are meeting for a third time. It's a lovely group of people, and they're very committed, and it actually is wonderful. So I would um, welcome a school committee representative for our third and final meeting, if you'd like to join and hear kind of the dialogue, but uh, we will produce a guideline document for your review. Uh, in a month. Do you know when that meeting is going to be? I don't. Leanne's working on it. You want me to send you an invite and factor you in? Or thank you, Carol. Yeah, thank you, Carol. That would be really mm -hmm. happy to do. I mean, what, you know, are there, have there been situations in schools, high schools, uh, related to this? Yes. What, what are some of the problems and how do they occur? And how do you prevent so, them? So, I guess what I would say is that we have a lovely system in the Western Public Schools where our school nurses and every school staff with a school nurse manage a team of people who respond to things that do happen, right? Student specific things, food related things, other items that we kind of come up with. Um, what we're trying to do is codify those really good responses so that it's consistent across the buildings and people know what to expect as parents. Um, and so, things like posting the chemical composition of some of the cleaning 
cleaning things we're using online so people can read them and know if it's something they want to talk to somebody about at the school. So it's been great to have parents and they've been super supportive. Um, things come up and the nurses are great, but we're going to get some guidelines in place. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you also want to talk about ESPERT? Sure. So another acronymized project. So you remember ESPERT, which is our substance abuse screening. And the step that's happened since the last time we reported out to you is that we have sent a parent notification letter to 500 families, right? So to um, 250 10th grade parents and then the 7th grade parents. And so they've received that. We've received uh, two responses back. One was awesome with like three exclamation points, mm -hmm. and I took that as positive. And the other was also quite positive, just said thank you. So we have not yet received anybody who's feeling um, that this was intrusive or not what they wanted for their children. We'll keep track of that. Um, there's an opt-out procedure that's identified in the email communication for families. And uh, we'll keep you posted. We're aiming for January, February of 2019, this winter, for the actual screen. Yeah, but this is a state requirement, right? This is a state so requirement. So all schools have to do it. Just combined. explain a little yeah. bit more what the purpose of behind it. So the governor's uh, initiative around particularly um, opioid awareness and screening began this process. This is a much broader substance abuse screening, and we are complying with that law and uh, doing it in a very thoughtful way for 7th and 10th graders. And this will be our first go-around this year, and we'll learn from from it. We've been uh, trained twice now by the state. We went to a training and then a trainer came here last week and did a follow-up training. So. The state believes that by talking to kids, uh, we can learn something about how to be more effective and secondly, we may be able to help people. Yep, it's a first order prevention approach for screening and raising awareness and discussion in the community. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Okay, so next, uh, I just wanted to update you on where we are with the security audit. So uh, since our last meeting, we have awarded the bid. It is awarded to um, an organization called Dynamic Security Strategies. And I included some brief biographical information about the consultants that we're gonna be working with in your packet. So um, we're gonna be working with David Corbin and Bonnie Mikeman. I am very excited to engage in this work with them. I think they're going to be great. They have um, decades of experience in this industry. They have worked in schools, though um, much of their work currently is in hospitals. So Bonnie is the Director of Police Security and Outside Services at MGH, and um, David is the Director of Police Security and Parking at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I will say that when I met with them, it's clear to me that working in hospitals gives them a lot of insight into, um, I think it's a, a neat fit for the schools in the sense that they really have a keen understanding that you have to provide safety and security within a culture and an environment that has to be welcoming um, and relatively open, right? Um, so they really demonstrated a lot of insight into that. Um, they're local, we're confident that they will tailor their work specifically to meet our needs. And uh, so we are having a kickoff meeting tomorrow for this process. They're coming out to the district and meeting with the whole district leadership team, all of the building principals. We're going to talk through the process. And the goal is to have the work completed with a set of recommendations with, for the schools within 90 days. And once they finish up their work with the schools, then they'll move on to the municipal projects. Well, they would work at least as a part of this process too. Yes, absolutely. So, um, just to remind people, the procurement process we went through where we interviewed people, I did that in collaboration with Mike Gillette and Chief Silva and Chief Deckers, and he was involved as well. Um, so we're all at the table for that, and yeah, we're clear that um, whatever is decided for the schools, we have to be working in a you know, synergistic way with um, police and fire. So the report will be in 90 days, or the work will be completed? The report within 90 days. So how long to it? Uh, well, I don't know. So the report it will contain phased recommendations, so they will kind of spell out for us. We think this is the first priority, and then you know they'll set, um, they're aware of the fact that organizations aren't always able to afford to do everything at once, so they'll try to prioritize things for us. So it could be a mix of capital and income. Or something. Yeah. Some capital could be some. Something personnel, else, yeah. personnel, procedures, right? It could be any number of um, any number of things. So. Some of the funding coming from town. 
So all of the funding for this is coming from that warrant article that was passed at town meeting. You might recall the voters um, appropriated $125,000 to do this for schools and municipal. Right. And um, we worded the article such that if the audit cost less than that, any remaining funds could be used to start implementing recommendations. So there will be some money, I can't remember the exact number, but I'm gonna say probably about $30,000 left from that to begin working on recommendations <coughs> immediately if there was something that really did we, needed to happen. Did we have or any kind of report the last time that we did this? I'm trying to remember if we had a, a written report that we could get. Yeah. Give to them so just to give them a, a baseline of where. I don't know if we did have a report. That was really like a working group. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, I can't, couldn't remember because we did have. Um, I think we came up with procedure. We had the and state police. And, yeah. Yes. So all of the things, all of the work that came out of that, all of our protocols and our procedures and our written incident manuals, they will be reviewing all of those materials and giving us feedback. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, great. Um, just wanted to mention our parent and student, some of our parent and student programming. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we rolled out our parent programs for the year. I just have them up here on the screen. Um, and this is sort of a new format for us this year that we thought we would try to get everything scheduled at the beginning of the year and allow people to save the dates and kind of know what was on the, the horizon. So I'm hoping that people are finding that um, helpful. I got a couple of very nice emails from parents when we sent it out. Um, and in addition, we are really trying to make sure that the connection is clear between the parent programming and some of our district strategy, our uh, improvement strategy work. And um, you know, we very much want to partner with families around some of these issues. So. If you look at the programming, I think you can see the district strategy here that clearly we have some STEM initiatives, so we're doing some parent education around elementary science and what that looks like today. And then we have programs in support of all three of our strategic priorities around um, a healthy, supported school community, things around student social emotional needs, um, supporting the needs of students in an increasingly diverse community, and also helping students navigate the technology to use the environment in a way that's safe and healthy and balanced. So um, hopefully parent programs kind of represent the strategy come to life here. Um, and then I just also included in your packet for your information, the high school is continuing its Courageous Conversations initiative this year, and they plan some programming for each of the four terms. See there, we had the Flip Down South African Gumboot Dancers a couple weeks ago. That was awesome. Can't wait to see that. Um, in term two, we have an, alum, an LGBTQ alumni panel coming to speak with students. And then um, some mental health programming in term three, and in term four, a program around healthy relationships. Some good stuff here on the horizon. Okay, next is a bittersweet um, thing to be talking about. So um, we are publicly announcing that Heath Petraka, our Director of Business and Finance, has decided to retire this March. And it uh, sounds like he has some great plans for retirement. So we are happy and excited for you, Heath, as you contemplate this next step. But um, obviously, Heath's departure is going to leave some big shoes to fill. Um, he has been with the district, I think, since 1999. Okay, 1999, and he started. Vintage. vintage. He started as uh, the director of food services, and then was our director of operations before moving into his current position. So you know, he has a, a deep knowledge of the district that is going to be hard to um, hard to replicate. So um, he is graciously uh, has come up with a retirement date that will see us through the budget process. And we'll also see us through the MSBA vote into the feasibility stage. So it's going to leave us in good shape. And um, that leaves us with a search. So we are going to be posting the position in the next two weeks. I have been in touch with MASBO, which is the professional organization for school business officials. I've had some conversations with them about the market. Um, the market for this <coughs> is somewhat tight, but I think we're in agreement that this will be an attractive position. So I'm hoping we can get somebody experienced. 
The plan at this point is to post for a July 1 start date, unless an earlier start date is mutually agreeable, and then um, start planning to have an interim for three months in the spring, maybe even a little more than three months, so we can plan some transition. Interim. Who would you go for? Retired? People yeah, somebody who's already been a school business yeah. director who right. could, who's retired and can come in and, you know, to keep things moving along for it. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I just want to say that I've been on the committee since he joined us, and he really has been terrific. Um, he, he's done so much for the system, and they are very big shoes to fill. We're going to miss you. Of course, we have a long time to... Mm -hmm. If you feel well, but yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, yeah. Right. Thank you. Appreciate your work. Thank you so much. I am not leaving yet. Okay. Let's skip one item. Okay. Um, so I just want to say a few words about the class sizes. I have a lengthier report in here. Packet, um, but I thought it might be helpful to give you some information about our class sizes as we start to think about the budget development. Um, elementary, we, we talk about elementary enrollment all the time. So you're familiar with this chart, and I can tell you nothing has changed since uh, last month. That's good news. That is, that is very good news. Our elementary class sizes right now are quite good. All of the classes, with the exception of Downey grade three, are within guideline. Um, and we're in good shape there. Our enrollment projections from NESDEC estimates that next year's kindergarten enrollment will be virtually the same as this year's kindergarten enrollment. So here we are. What we don't talk about as often are um, middle school and high school class sizes, so I just wanted to frame up some things for folks here. Um, so the overall enrollment at the middle school you know, we have experienced sort of an enrollment bubble for a number of years, but it has now started to decline. So the enrollment at the middle school decreased by about 50 students between last year and this year. And next year's enrollment is projected to decrease by approximately another 35. Um, and in fact, the enrollment is projected to decline over the next several years. We kept staffing levels the same last year as the enrollment started to go down, and that has provided some much needed relief um, in terms of uh, class sizes and, and space. So the school committee guideline for the middle school class sizes is 18 to 24 students, ideally not higher than 28. That's how it's worded. Across 164 core academic classes, so these five subjects. Right now, uh, we only have 15 sections that have 25 or more students, so that's about 9% of the sections across the school. Uh, none of those four academic classes exceed 28, so everything is within the line. There are classes in the <coughs> arts rotation that have higher class sizes. Um, some of that, I think, is a function of so the, the bottom line here is that we're in very good shape right now for the middle school classes. Looking at foreign language, mm -hmm. that seems to be uh, high. Mm -hmm. That and is. Planning. We may take a, look, take a look at that. So this is just sort of factual information, and we'll be thinking about all of this when we, yeah. when we think about it. And then the high school classes, it's a little different. So. Um, the high school enrollment, the enrollment bubble is at the high school, right? So we're at a 10-year high with our high school enrollment. And that enrollment is projected to stay about the same over the next couple of years, and then we'll start to decline. Um, by about 2024, 25, the high school is projected to dip back under 900, which has not been the case at the high school since about 20. It's kind of the arc of it. Managing class sizes at the high school is a little more complex. It's just a more complicated master schedule. And um, so class sizes are driven by a number of factors. So the overall enrollment, when the number of students goes up, that impacts class sizes. But also the fact that there are course levels at the high school is um, another variable. And we have um, a, a robust elective program 
at the high school. So there's a lot more choice for high school students, and we try to monitor those choices, which means that the master scheduling process is harder <laughs> sometimes. Um, so the school committee guideline for high school is the same as the middle school, class sizes of 18 to 24, ideally not larger than 28. Right now at the high school of the 224 core academic classes, 52 classes, nearly a quarter, 23%, have 25 or more students, um, including 18 sections with 28 or more students. I think 18 have 28 and one section is 20. So most of those relatively high class sizes are a result of the increased enrollment at the high school. Some of them, though, reflect challenges in the master scheduling process that resulted in skewed section sizes. Right? We hope that they would kind of break more evenly, and they didn't. And we have a couple of large singleton classes. So you say you have a class that 28 kids want to take it, 128, you break it into 14. Um, the interesting thing is because of the complexity of the master schedule at the high school, you also end up with more small sections. So about 20% of the classes of the high school are below 15 students. And that partly is um, because of some choices we make in the scheduling process around level three classes. We tend to keep those small. And then also in response to student elected choices. So there may be times when we have, say, 11 kids who are really into a particular thing, and we want to be able to offer that program, um, particularly some of the upper level electives, where it's like, you know, the fourth year of the sequence. But I'm looking at it's English and social studies are exceptionally high. Yes. Right? And those are the classes, it, it, are they the upper level classes, level one and AP? Um, all different. Levels. Those are the classes yeah. that require the most writing and correcting. Yes. So how is that? How, how is that impacting the teaching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good question. <coughs> and so you know that's that's another variable, right? There's there's class size, and then there's also teacher load, um, which at the high school, you know, if you teach five sections and you had five classes of 25, that would be a very high teacher load in terms of being able to provide time and feedback and whatnot and student work. So um, what I wanted to show you here, and this is related to your question, is that in the FY19 budget, we added a math teacher and a science teacher. And you can see here what the result of that was, right? I mean, it's pretty simple that when you add more staff, you can have more sections, and then all the class sizes go down. So we are really able to make a difference. Versus, as you point out, to something in English and social studies, where we didn't add staff last year, we just had to make some choices. Um, and so, not surprisingly, the number of large sections has um, either remained basically the same or even increased a little bit. So we'll be taking a look at this. Uh, during the budget. Right? During the budget season, yeah. yeah. So when we added more electives for the last couple of years, particularly I think we added some semester funds. Uh, yeah. Like, right? How did that, did that impact at all? We didn't really add staff, right? We just... Right. So what we, we did a couple of things. We had a lot of more electives in the social studies department, yeah. and we just created, um, I would say, greater variety, right? So it was still, it's still basically seniors taking social studies. So the population of kids who need classes has remained the same, but we just have more choice. So if you have more choice, though, wouldn't you have that we had five social studies classes as opposed to three the mm -hmm. previous year? Well, so we just have, we have fewer sections of some things because not as many people are taking a given thing. And then because we, we didn't add to staff, yeah. so we just, okay. Yeah, exactly. Although I will point out that these numbers we're looking at, some of that is reflected, so I can't remember them off the top of my head, but, you know, for instance, the AP site numbers, I think, are quite high yeah. across the board. Some of it, some of the electives that we added were in the arts, which we're kind of not looking at on this chart. Um, some of the arts classes are by design very large. Right, so chorus, I think now is up at about 70-ish, closer to 80, okay. So, you know, that's sort of a big population of kids, which in some ways allows us to run smaller, you know, guitar classes, piano lab. But some of the AP classes are, are quite big now. They are. It's yeah, it's, it's, social studies, right? It's, it's an interesting um, phenomenon. I mean, I only know from the sidelines, but it yeah. seems they've become 
more and more popular as the college board has mm. done a terrific job in making it. I think kids feel as though they own, and the colleges too, I guess, they need those AP classes. So am I right? Are more and more kids going to? No, they've always been very. Uh, yeah. I, to, sorry, to no, Carol's no, point no. earlier, as we've added, I looked at this just today, as we've added electives and social studies, the percentage of kids taking a, not an extra uh, social studies course in addition to the one they originally take has increased. Oh, so the, um, we have a, about 1,100 kids taking social studies classes with 1,000 kids capable of taking, taking classes. Mm -hmm. So 10% of kids are an extra class, whereas it used to be pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio. I looked back about four years ago data, and it was like one-to-one, -one, and now it's about 10% uh, uh, of the like, which is several. So 100 kids, it's like four classes of 25 yeah. that we didn't like point. Okay. It's a nice problem. I mean, yeah, there's a percentage of our population that should have been taking AP, and our percentage was always like off of the track. It was like, I remember at one point, we had like 40% of the kids in AP classes, which wasn't what? Mm -hmm. Years, I don't maybe. Think that's the case now, yeah. No, not now, but I remember like when you started, yeah. that's everybody. So long ago. <laughs> I don't remember, but uh, <laughs> look at that. Uh, so I bring this to your attention just to say this is like the factual information that we're going to be looking at and analyzing as we think about the budget. Think about the budget process. Right. Okay. Um, big sit-down meeting with the MSBA just last week. So the meeting was attended by he, Charlie, Maya, and then Mike Gillette and um, Mike Walsh. And um, we went into Boston to the MSBA offices, and I guess I would bottom line it with I think the meeting was really good. We had a good meeting um, and found out some, um, some things. So. I, I was reminded through this process, and I feel like it's helpful to remind people in general about this, that we are very fortunate to be in this process with MSBA at all. The fact that we even have a seat at the table with the MSBA is fairly remarkable. Uh, I will tell you that last Friday, I was um, in a meeting with some superintendents, talking to a superintendent in a community that I would say is very similar to Westwood. I was asking him about building projects, people about now. And um, he was saying that they have multiple elementary building projects in their community now and that they're not involved with the MSBA. And I kind of expressed surprise and and he said, oh I keep throwing in the SOIs but we don't get invited in and we're not going to get invited in so we just have to locally fund it all. They're funding it all. Thank God for the hand on the So thank God. Okay. So, um, so I, I think it's good just to remember that this is fantastic. Um, the other bit of good news from my perspective, I think that we should feel really good about how we've engaged the MSBA and sort of how we got into this process at all. Um, we have clearly communicated our needs to them. They reflected back to us what they have heard from us at every stage of this process from when the SOI was submitted back when John Antonucci was in this seat, um, working with Heath, through the senior study when they came out to visit us last fall, to the educational profile that we submitted this August, um, they have heard us loud and clear about what all of our building needs are in the district, and they acknowledged that they heard it. <laughs> um, and they cited that master planning study that we did three years ago. They said, acknowledge we've done a lot of work, that was really helpful. I think that it's probably part of the reason that we got invited in. So I think that was a good investment. Um, and so that um, was great. I think there is nothing further we can do to convince them of our needs. <laughs> At this point, it really comes down to their budget and agreeing on the scope of a project that they will reimburse us for. That's really what it is. Um, which may be a project that <laughs> solves some of our needs and not all of them. I think that may be a reality. And that's um, that's where we are right now. They invited 18 communities in this round, we're one of 18. They have a certain amount of money to work with and they're trying to figure out through this process 
of meeting with communities what they can um, what they can do for each of us. The other bit of good news um, they shared with us is that our base 2018 reimbursement rate, this was super exciting, um, is 33.98%. And we had estimated that it would be 31 for the base, so um, we're, we will definitely take that. <laughs> Which take, is that? Is that, I'm just curious, is it higher because of the economy? What? I think it has to do with how much revenue they've got. Yeah. So it has to do with state sales yeah. tax yeah. and whatnot. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, so that's our base reimbursement rate, and we have not talked yet about our capital maintenance, our maintenance plan, right. yeah. and, you know. And energy efficiency stuff. So yeah. you're able to get additional percentages on that. We, we could potentially get bonus points. And so we had originally been saying, boy, with the bonus points, if we could get 33%, that would be great. So out of the gate, we're, um, we're very excited. So that was good news. The purpose of this meeting was for the MSBA to share with us their enrollment projections. Um, and so they shared their methodology and their enrollment projections. And this is the first step towards our agreeing on what they call the design enrollment number. We've got to agree on a number of kids that they are willing to build for. Um, so they presented us with their enrollment projections, and now we have some work to do. We've got to examine those projections. We've got to compare them to the projections we had done for years ago in the master planning study and uh, to the updated projection we had done for the MESDEC this fall. So we're going to be looking at that. We then have to agree on a number, and we have to provide them with some possible options that we would like to study in the feasibility study, which is the next phase. So that's the ball is sort of back in our court at this point, and we've got to come back to them with some information. They also clarified the timeline, so they told us that there was um, a, a, a miscommunication in the letter that they sent us last spring um, when they moved us into eligibility. They had said that November 28th was the deadline for agreeing on this design enrollment number. Turns out it was the deadline for having that meeting, that first meeting last week. Which makes a lot more sense, actually. So we have until the end of our eligibility period, which is February 28th, to agree on the design enrollment and to give them some options that we want to study in the feasibility study, which makes a lot of sense because we were thinking, what do we do between the end of November and February? Um, and they encourage us to take our time with this phase. We had talked about trying to get to feasibility sooner because we couldn't see what we were supposed to be doing. Um, now it's clear, and you know they've emphasized that it's important to get this part right, because <laughs> it's the premise for the project. Um, so you know we would have to have everything worked out in the next two weeks in order to get on their next board meeting, which isn't going to happen. If we wanted to still hurry things along, we could have things ready um, by about mid-January to get voted in February. But we actually have until the end of February if we want to take that long. It just means that we won't get voted into the feasibility study until our April. So that's where we are. So in February, mm -hmm. we have by February 28th, we have to have, we have to present options to them? So not options like here are the different projects we would do. We have to tell them we have to get to frame up for them what things we want to study in the feasibility study. And so they tell you that one of the options is required to be, um, what if you did nothing more but handle? They you have to look at that. Um, and then you, then you could say, this is hypothetical, right? But you could say, we're interested in studying what would happen if we consolidated from five buildings to four buildings and we took like, Deerfield Hall. Um, we're interested in looking at what would happen if we um, built a building where part of it was an early child center and the other part was, I'm making these things up, right? Um, but we have to sort of talk about what are some of the things we might want to look at. So what will be the process for getting those, the structure in there? How, how do do yeah, well, so I think we have some work to do internally <laughs> to look at some things. We first need to look at the enrollment projections, got to do some thinking um, and we have not had a lot of time to debrief that yet 
Um, and then, you know, I leave it up to the school committee. I, we could either come back to you in December and say, here's some things that we're thinking, or maybe you want to, a la a subcommittee, you know, Charlie and Mayo, and certainly um, the broad I think it's going to be well to get some input from other people outside mm -hmm. the, school, the school committee, just to say, mm -hmm. we're just doing a feasibility study, but this is what we're going for. One thing they did say that was a little surprising is that some, some great school systems, as good as you in Westwood, Nobody. have spent a lot of time submitting this and were rejected. So be careful. Not by the community. By the community. Not by MSBA. Right. Oh. The, the, town didn't, the town couldn't move forward. So one thing they stressed to us, which we, you know, Emily did a great job in the spring, but that we have been saying all along is a key element of this is community engagement because they've seen very similar communities to ours move through the whole feasibility project uh, process and then get stymied at town meeting where the town just throws it down. So we have to have some kind of a process that will engage the community in, in kind of structuring what the options are before the end of February. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, so I think there are two ways to look at it. I don't think that would occur, but all we have to do is say, here are like a, list, a laundry list of things that we'd like to look at. And we did a lot of that. Can we do that? I mean, I thought you said they had, were only allowed to look at like. No, I asked that. Oh, I mean, oh, it's, okay. I mean, the more options we look at, the more expensive the feasibility phase would be. Like, if we look right. at 10 different options, it's going to be more expensive, it's be more expensive than study. if we look at two. Yeah. Um, yeah. Frankly, the fact that we're in this design enrollment process with them, though, it's going to it's going to put some parameters on the scope of the project, and so that may be helpful. You know, when we get that kind of clarification. I think the, it would be worth that while the school committee to come up with some options and then ask for some open feedback from the community. Go out and say, what are, what are your thoughts? You know, this is what we believe. We have the chance to get funding if we proceed on this time. But I think it would be valuable to get community input based on what we think are the options that we'd like to propose. But I think we need to ask for a meeting, a community open meeting where people come in and well, offer advice. But, but that has to be that has to be planned. I mean we have yeah. to we don't have that much time. I still want to emphasize that all we're doing here is saying here are things we want to study. Right. So <laughs> we know? can we'll brainstorm on this and, I mean yeah. I don't want to minimize it, but it, the uh, we could do yeah. this in I have a yellow yeah, that, where I started yeah, to yeah. brainstorm some things. Yeah. So yeah. that's what we have to do. And then we do a feasibility study, and that is still when we, when this group needs to do the educational program, and that's where we have to get all kinds of community input, because that ultimately is the thing where we say, and now let's use this as the criteria for figuring out which of these things we want to go forward with. Um, so I don't think that what we learned changes anything about that feasibility study process and we want to make sure that we're getting that we're getting engaging the community and getting input around like real things, not um, you know I speculation and, yeah. and brainstorming. We need to have some facts. What about a project manager? And I know we talked about that timeline, but when is it that we're gonna So we're the know? MSBA requires you to hire the OPM as the first step in your feasibility study. So once after we get the February twenty eighth. Yeah. Once we get voted in. Once we get voted in. In April. If, if we, oh, in April. Yeah, because okay. if we stay all the way out to February 28th, if that's our deadline and yeah. we submit all this, then we'll be on their April board meeting. Right. Okay. I'd also like to just say, we, there were four of these people you know, who knew us. You know, it was like, <laughs> and I want to thank you know, Heath and Emily and other staff who did an awful lot of homework to A, to get us even accepted in this thing. You know, so. But they, they knew us inside out and the school and every little thing in him. The second thing I think it uh, I want to you know, thank Mike Gillette and, and, and Mike Walsh to go on there. They're very committed to want this thing to work and they're impressed I think with our town suckman and, you know, and and Mike Gillette, our town manager. So it was a, I thought it was a very positive meeting from, from that perspective. You know, we seemed to have our act together. We they really were impressed with all the engineering work we did before. And we knew a lot of the details about what would be needed. So it was a very, you know, positive. But I want to thank you for all the work you did to get us to that point, you know, where we're now in, in, in mayor who came in, who was going to be our chairman of the big committee when it gets going. Uh, I think had a lot of great questions from all of them. I think they said, who's this person? <laughs> she knows a lot about real estate and uh, things like this. So I think they were impressed with wanting to work with us. So. Yeah. Well, that's great. 
So it was a great first meeting. I think we've got a long ways to go. <laughs> and, um, and then, as you said, the most important part is convincing the town that whatever it is we want to do, they're going to support. So. And, and they did say, you may need other ways to get money, other things. You know, we can do maybe one thing of maybe three things you need, you know, but don't count on us to deal with all your three things. So right. they made that kind of clear that you may have need other ways to get money other than us. Yeah. And anything you want. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do think that this would be a good time to update the community. I kind of held off on sending that letter that I had mentioned. Yeah. And we have a deadline coming up for the town newsletter, I think. Weeks. Yeah, so I, you know, it seems yeah. reasonable to ever be here. I thought that might be a good way to get out to all residents through the town newsletter and just let them know where we are. So it's two things. So yeah. we're going to come back and talk about this in December. Yeah. So is that what we agreed to? Just to make sure. Sure, and I am happy to you know send out uh, communications just about any thinking that we have in the interim. But in terms of sort of deliberating, um, so you'll come in with some suggestions. That's great. Right. Did you want to do something? Yeah, do you, I mean, we, I think that would be great if we did that. You know, maybe the possibility of just if people would like to talk more about it. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, the school committee would welcome you to be involved as much as you want, but I you know, prior to the next school committee, we would talk about it more formally. We may have some. You already have. Oh, maybe two people. I mean, I think it yeah. would make yeah. a great deal of sense to have you, given that you're carrying on the school building. I'd like to help if I could. Unless you're going to do it. No, I'll, I'll be working with, but right. other okay. committee members would like to just yeah. be involved prior to the next meeting. Yeah. yeah. If you're having a report or questions you may have that we could do homework before the next meeting. Right. Yeah. Right. And then the second one, so if we go with the sort of end of February mm -hmm. and get approved in April, I'm just kind of setting the timeline. This is fine. That means we're basically doing community engagement next fall. Probably. If you need to get an opinion, I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to, I just want to, because no, I have a goal. Right. I just, I just want to be, I, we have a goal, so I just want to be, we should be transparent. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Okay, this is fine. I think you're right. Um, you know, our intention prior to this meeting had been, let's try and move this along, yeah, because, you yeah. know, but, and, and I think that's still possible, but, you know, I really have reflected on, they were very clear, like, get this part right. Um, but yeah, it does push it out. Okay. Yeah. We definitely want it over the summer. Right. No, no, we can't do that. Right. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay. Oh, I want to say one feel good thing. That's okay. I'm a little behind, but this is just exciting. So, a highlight right here where it says live from the Nowdy School in Westwood, Massachusetts. So, we have an, an author visit coming. December to the Downey School out of this book called Rescue and Jessica Rescue is a Rescue Dog. And we just found out that the authors and illustrator are going to be working with students at Downey and they're going to be live streaming it and classrooms and librarians across the nation can register to be part of this, um, the, this program. And it happens, I, perhaps it is, isn't just a coincidence, maybe Mrs. Gallagher designed it this way, but it's occurring during National School, Inclusive Schools Week. Um, so it's all great. Coming together. Coming together, very exciting. And the last exciting, I, when we talk about buildings and security update, I always think we should also talk about learning. Right. Exciting things that are happening in the classroom. Just in time for tomorrow's midterm elections, the um, high schools, um, well, you see here it says most trusted and then crossed out only political news magazine, <laughs> uh, was published uh, with some helpful information leading into the midterms. And I um, did just want to mention, because you'll notice that, that Chris, who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight, your school committee student rep, is one of the editors of the article. Oh. So I think. He has a SIT project about student civic engagement, so I think he would want me to remind people to get out and vote tomorrow, so I'll save that. His he back. wrote a helpful piece on question one. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, that's right. You can check it out on our, on our website. I also just would like to thank, we're now beginning to get some uh, articles in the newspapers about things going on in the school system. I, if you haven't seen this one, uh, I just was in both newspapers 
It was a, a tremendous summary of the STEM work being done in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and that really summarizes beautifully, you know, the results and where it's going and uh, the importance of getting women into understanding they can be engineers. And so it's a really beautifully written piece describing our. Uh, so it's, just be sure to read the local paper. Uh, really put that in. That was an excellent job. And also, they had a piece in there about uh, Spanish students visiting and also about uh, a play. So, we're getting some good uh, writers from the school system uh, sharing with the public some of the wonderful things that have been done. Uh, a public participation now, if anybody would like to have something to say, uh, we encourage people to come forward and uh, we'd like you to keep it to a couple of minutes if you wouldn't mind. If you give your name and address, uh, and we're not here to have engage in a, a debate, but we'd love to have your input or your thoughts if, uh, if anybody's here would like to speak. Maybe we've answered all the questions. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming still. The discussion items. Number one, uh, J-Term Pilot. Great, thank you. So I'm going to invite up Jonas Schur, who is going to be presenting to you. Jonas is... Um, so he is a dual role. He is a social studies teacher at the high school, and he's also the district professional development coordinator. And it was in that capacity that he pretty much ended up overseeing J term, which we now joke, though the J is for June, it's really for Jonas, because this is his, uh, his project. So, Uh, thank you, and thank you uh, to you and everybody uh, at the table for welcoming me here. Um, again, we said I have a dual role. I've been a classroom teacher. This is my 15th year uh, at Westwood. Um, I have to say, I've given plenty of presentations in the classroom, and I'm used to kind of walking around as opposed to kind of sitting at the congressional subcommittee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I will, I will do my best um, in this role. But I am very excited to, to talk with you guys about, uh, about J-Term and STEM, a really exciting project. Um, that's really gone on now for about two and a half years in high school. Um, a little bit of just uh, some information to refresh everybody's memory on what J-Term uh, is. A five-day intensive immersing, immersive learning experience. Uh, students choose their own course. Courses are on a pass-fail basis. Um, students are awarded credits for passing. Uh, the courses are designed to evoke authentic engagement and learning, and we'll be talking more about that in just a minute. It's an opportunity for students to experience a different kind of learning that isn't possible in the normal schedule that we offer at the high school. Uh, and for teachers, uh, a big theme of what we'll talk about here is, is a creative professional experience um, to work, again, uh, outside the confines of their uh, normal schedule um, and also with colleagues as well. Um, the vision of J-Term really uh, revolves around students being authentically engaged in learning. Um, this, uh, chart here by an educational psychologist um, kind of speaks to the different levels of engagement that we often see with students in schools. Um, I think as a culture uh, at the high school in my 15 years uh, in the building, we've been really good at the ritual compliance and the strategic compliance. Our kids are very high performing. They obviously do quite well, um, and that's great. But the uh, authentic engagement and learning um, is a challenge, not just for Westwood students, but I think for all high school students they, they do face a lot of external pressures. Um, we really wanted to create something that would give students an opportunity to really experience learning in its purest form without any of the um, kind of extrinsic motivators that they really are used to since um, almost elementary school. Uh, so that's the, the vision of J-Term. This literally is the vision of J-Term. Um, I won't read the entire piece here, but just to say that um, J-Term classes are meant to be hands-on. They are meant to be experiences for students. Um, uh, many of them, uh, as as you probably know, I'm sure, uh, are out in the field, not just in the classroom. Um, and they are centered around doing and making um, as an essential part of learning. Um, I wanted to take a couple minutes or less and just remind people um, kind of what J-Term looked like. Uh, we uh, have some wonderful photos that um, were taken from, in some cases, students, in some cases, teachers. Uh, one of the uh, most popular things we did last year during J-Term was to create an Instagram feed um, so that students could see uh, what each other was up to in their class. Also for parents and other community members, uh, we got a lot of comments from people saying they were checking the Instagram feed throughout the week. Um, so this is what it looked like. This is, of course, our scuba diving class. This is our weather and geology of New England, traveling to, I believe, Cape Cod. This is our So You Think You Can Rock class. <laughs> 
Uh, Summit New England Peaks. This class actually um, did five separate days of uh, hiking five peaks in five different New England states. Uh, we have our Top Chef West Loop course here, as well as our Be a Maker class. This is actually a leaf glass blowing that you're seeing on, on the right side. Uh, this is a trip to the Lizzie Boarding House. This was our horror movies and horror uh, and literature course. Um, these students were um, authentically uh, pretty freaked out by this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hot topics in biotechnology. Uh, we have a few here. You'll see, um, again, So You Think You Can Rock, uh, as well as our Be a Maker class. They brought in a, a guest uh, professor to do a um, demo lesson on ceramics. Our photography in the field course, which um, Emily Park still taught. Uh, this is basic carpentry and wiring. Um, they built a shed that is now uh, at Hale Reservation and is um, uh, hopefully very useful for them. Uh, CSI with Westwood, which uh, Sean Bevan co taught. Again, Top Chef. On the right hand side, this is our democracy course. Um, you're seeing a mock Senate debate. Uh, on the left, this is uh, the stories that connect us. They visited a radio station to learn about um, interviews and how stories are told. Our painting with a purpose course and our destination aviation course. Uh, this is the art of the moving title, which is a um, graphic design and video course. Uh, statistics in sports, a numbers game on the left. As you can see, they visited Gillette Stadium. This again is weather and geology of New England. They made a uh, visit to Boston City Hall to learn about climate change from a uh, city official. And two more, we have uh, again Scuba and I believe Top Chef again on the right. So uh, that was just a minute just to remind you guys what, um, what it looked like. Um, some quick facts and figures. Last year we ran 36 courses. Um, JTRM was offered for all nine through 11th graders. Uh, 12th graders had obviously graduated at that point. Um, almost all of the courses were co-taught, um, usually in teams of two or three. We did have a couple of courses that were taught in teams of four and five teachers. Um, the courses were mixed by grade level. The average class size, about 21 students, with a student-faculty ratio of eight to one. Obviously, we were able to do that because of the fact that seniors weren't in the building. Um, we'll talk more about registration, but um, most students received their first choice, and almost 90% received one of their top two choices, which we were really happy to be able to do for kids. Um, and most of our courses involve off-site travel. Uh, special education was uh, very much still offered uh, uh, throughout the week. We had instructional aides and classes um, signed by our special ed director. Uh, and absences, um, about 35 per day, which um, Sean reminded me is actually less than what we typically get on the first day of school. So the attendance was actually better for, this was actually very late in June, you'll remember all the snow days last year. Um, we wrapped up day tournament on June 25th, so to have that level of attendance was really phenomenal. Um, so that was a look on kind of what JTRM looked like. I want to spend a little bit of time um, kind of talking about how we got to that point and the course development process, both um, for students, also for teachers. Um, Emily first introduced this idea to faculty in the spring of 2016. Um, prior to that, she actually had many individual conversations with teachers. Um, but this is just to highlight how people were feeling when they first were formally introduced to this. And, and it's to show you that the vast majority of teachers were very positive about it. And I would credit um, Emily for a lot of the work she did ahead of time to really bring people on board with what I think is potentially a big ask for teachers. Um, so, uh, the steering committee we formed um, shortly thereafter, then previous to this, there had been a planning committee, but we uh, then formed a JTRM steering committee. It was made up of 17 uh, teachers, administrators, and also Charlie Donahue, who is our school committee representative. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for being part of that process. Uh, we've held 12 meetings um, up until J term of last year. We've had an additional meeting already this fall. And the tasks of that committee um, varied. They were, uh, in many cases, to vet courses, to talk about viability and value for courses. Um, they met individually with teaching teams to provide feedback and try to steer the, those courses. Uh, there was a lot of logistics that had to take place with this, um, the amount of field trips, the budget requests, the order of equipment. They handled much of that. Um, to gather and analyze feedback from staff and students, and then finally to plan uh, professional development sessions. About the professional development, we spent about two years of uh, PD, uh, six early release Wednesdays one year and seven the next, plus a full day of professional development in 2016. Uh, the structure of those sessions varied. 
I'm going to walk you through what our full day looks like um, pretty briefly. Uh, but I would say that in general, the professional development um, in some cases consisted of teachers just working on their own for their courses, but in many cases was um, faculty-wide. I want to highlight that we made it very explicit to teachers that the amount of time we were spending on professional development was not just for the five days of J-term. Um, we really did strongly believe that a lot of what we were doing about working together as colleagues and working on skills about curriculum development was very much uh, applicable to good teaching. Um, and you know, to invest this amount of time and resources into five days, I don't, I'm not sure anybody would really um, necessarily find that valuable, but um, the extent to which this affected teachers beyond the, just J-term, I think is really remarkable, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, so just briefly, I want to walk you through what I mean by that in terms of the professional development and how it affected teachers, how it benefited them beyond day term. We did do a little bit of research quickly on this first day of um, this full day PD in 2016, looking at what other schools had done. There were very few public schools who had um, run a program like this, but we did have some models in private schools that we reached out to. Um, we walked faculty through um, a lot of creativity exercises. One of the first things we had to do was create what these courses were going to be. And we wanted to um, teach some of the skills involved with thinking creatively, uh, divergent thinking, thinking about multiple solutions. We had members of our faculty who led those um, workshops and discussions for, for teachers, people who had had a background in creativity uh, and design thinking. Um, we asked uh, teachers to really kind of exercise some blue sky thinking to think about um, whatever might be possible before they kind of thought about the logistics and why we couldn't do different courses. We basically opened it up and said, think of anything you could teach any students anything you wanted to teach, what would it be? Um, and we started with that in mind. We looked at all the ideas that came in, and we had teachers um, kind of place those on, the, on a matrix that looked at how valuable would this be for students and how engaged with the students be in the course. And this is just an array of what came out of that. Um, you can see in some of these uh, proposals, there are some courses that did eventually run. So you can see basic carpentry and wiring. How to be happy ended up being a course called the Pursuit of Happiness, um, and there's some courses here that, that didn't like create a, create a graphic novel um, or following Thoreau in a canoe, which sounds lovely, but it didn't run. Um, we involved a lot of peer feedback um, from teachers throughout this process. For two years, um, we had at least three sessions where teachers met with one another. Um, two of those sessions were in uh, consistent teams where they could track each other's progress and provide feedback. That's not a skill that teachers get to work on very often, is providing peer feedback. We obviously do a lot of feedback to students, but the idea of um, giving and receiving feedback from a peer, I think another example of um, some of the professional development here that isn't really just about J-term. It's about a professional culture. Uh, in that point of the uh, course development process, we um, obviously wanted to involve students um, and make sure that we were offering courses that were appealing to them. Um, we ran several focus groups, um, really at two different stages. Um, the first stage we ran just with titles and of course descriptions and teachers. One of the um, chief concerns we heard from faculty was, what happens if I spend two years developing a course and nobody takes it? Um, and so we heard that feedback and we, we took a lot of steps to make sure that no one was going too far in this without input from kids to make sure that what they were creating was really in um, kids' best interest. Um, and at the end of that process, this is the list that we came up with. So these are the 36 courses that we ran last year. The courses that have an asterisk are courses that are likely not running this year. Um, why not? Yeah, there's, there's a variety of reasons why courses aren't running this year. Um, I would say the most common reason has to do with teachers who aren't in the building anymore. So if a course was led, for example, the Criminal Mind, the, the chief faculty member on that course is, is on a leave of absence. Um, there's probably about eight or nine courses in total that aren't running, and I'd say at least half of them, that's the reason why. There are a couple courses that aren't running because student enrollment was very low. They were very successful courses, but the teachers were concerned that they had exhausted the subset of kids that would take that course. And in both of those cases, the teachers have actually decided to, to run a new course this year, but keep the old one in the back pocket to potentially come back to um, as kids graduate and as new kids come up who haven't taken that course before. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I thought these guys were Boston Sounds fabulous. Yeah. 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 So um, two of the okay. teachers. Yeah. 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 Two of the teachers in that course are no longer working at the high school. Um, and you couldn't get anybody else. <laughs> so what we've done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what we've done, and you'll see it. I know the list of the, the new courses for this year. Um, 
we do have a course that has some similarity to this. It's an urban walking to learn about Boston's neighborhoods. Um, it will physically they'll be eating as well, but it's not centered around food. <laughs> um, so there's some similarity. But yeah, that was a great course. And that was actually a pretty highly um, attended course yeah. for those students in that. So how did you address, so there was 11% of students who were unlikely or very unlikely yeah. to recommend. I, I'm guessing if you looked at that distribution, they were not evenly distributed. By, by course. By course. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you yep. address that? Right. So um, steering committee members met to look at all the feedback from all the courses. We obviously also shared the feedback with the teachers. Um, and we did have conversations with, um, there weren't too many of those courses, which was great, but there, there were probably about, uh, say, three or four courses where we um, had conversations with teachers about, you know, why do you think this feedback um, was the way it was. In a couple of those cases, those courses aren't running this year. I think the teachers maybe kind of felt that what they created wasn't um, kind of living up to the vision of, of J-Term or, or compared to other kids' experiences. Um, but there are a couple of situations in which the teachers have just tried to rework the course. And that's going to be a process that's going to go on this year as well. Did you poll the kid, all of the kids? I mean, even the kids would not have opportunity next year. So the 11th yes. graders were polled? Yeah, they were, yes. Um, and I'll show you at the end. Just to make that um, on parent communication, so um, Sean took a few of our um, courses that were created in this process before registration and um, made some, I think, really impressive looking kind of blow up posters of them. And during um, parent curriculum night, I believe, or conference night, oh. or, yeah, both, thank you. Um, we held um, essentially a coffee and conversation with Sean and Emily and Allison and other administrators where parents who had questions about J Term um, could have those questions answered. Um, and it was also to um, build up some uh, community support for the program as well. Um, one of our major goals was to make sure that kids were truly um, uh, committed to their courses, that they were they were fit into the courses that they really wanted to be in. The whole idea of authentic engagement doesn't work if the student is placed into a course that they don't like. We spent a lot of time trying to think of how do we make sure that kids end up with the right course for them. So we created a two-day experience for kids that we called shopping. Um, it wasn't a full two days, it was about hour and a half, I believe, over two afternoons. Um, and we asked kids to pick eight courses after looking through the website that we created and the course descriptions to pick eight courses that they wanted to shop. Mm -hmm. Teachers ran 10-minute sessions where they gave a quick pitch about what their course would be like. Um, and what we found, these pie charts here, we, these reflect kids' choices of the courses they want to shop. And I love these charts, just to be clear on what it is. Each color, each sliver you're seeing represents a different course. So in the, in the first choice, which is the upper left, you'll see a couple courses that have larger slices of the pie. But by the time we get to like kids' third choice course, it's very different. And so that really fit what we were looking for, which was that we created a, a list of 36 courses that there was something for everyone. Um, it wasn't as if we created one course that everybody wanted to take and 35 courses that no one wanted to take. Um, the same was also reflected when kids actually registered. So we did have a couple courses that were really popular. But overall, you can see a lot of different colors, a lot of different slices um, here that um, there was not, um, or there was a pretty good amount of diversity in terms of what kids were looking for. And like I said, um, about 89% of students ended up with one of their first two choices. Uh, the cost. So the total cost of J-Term for last year, you can see 52385 um, About 10000 of that is goods and equipment that we purchased that is reusable. Um, so, for example, for our um, strategy board game course, those board games still exist in the building and will be used again this year. Um, but the majority of that, uh, of the cost is, is in money that um, was spent and not on equipment that can be uh, brought back. Uh, a big chunk of it was transportation. We had many courses that took trips. Um, most of that was through the bus. We did have a couple of courses that um, traveled to Boston uh, through train. Um, we also made use of uh, the transportation vehicles that we have, the, the smaller bus as well. Um, and then there were things like entrance fees for things like museums, you saw the Lizzie Borden Museum materials that were consumed. So, for example, the ceramics and glass blowing, a lot of that material may not be usable again. And food, which is prior, uh, primarily for the Boston Foodies course. So, a little bit of good news about the that course. And for Top Chef, yes. Um, Boston Foodies was expensive. We, that was one of the only courses where we provided kids lunch because food was central to the course in Top Chef um, as well, which was one of our most popular courses that we offered. When you break down the total cost of J-Term for 750 students, it comes out to about $57 per pupil, um, which we obviously feel like was 
uh, well worth it. I want to just briefly mention that a, a good chunk of this funding came from the Foundation for Western Education. They gave us a $20,000 grant, which was extremely generous, um, but was, of course, a one-time grant, so we don't have that um, for this coming year. So uh, feedback that we collected from students, faculty, and parents. Um, so here's some of that quantitative feedback from students. Uh, we asked them about the mission. Um, this is what we were trying to do. Do you think we were successful in achieving that, uh, essentially, in, in trying to create authentic learning experiences for kids? Um, and combined here, we're looking at about 95% saying um, either very successful or successful. The majority of students saying we're very successful in achieving that mission. How excited would you be to participate in another JTRM course next year? Uh, again, 85% of students saying they would be excited to participate. So we were really um, happy with those numbers. I want to highlight just some qualitative data. So we did, um, to your question earlier, we did survey all 750 kids. Um, it was a mandatory part of the last day for each course. And I've highlighted a few themes that emerged from the kids' feedback. First, we thought students were generally excited to attend school, which we don't always hear. Um, they viewed J-Term as less stressful, um, but as a learning experience. They were very clear in saying this wasn't just um, a fruit for all. This was learning without all those stressors that they're used to. Um, you can see a quote right here. It was similar to, in fact, that we were learning, but there was no homework. Again, homework is being one of those external um, pieces of regular school. And we saw this a lot, kids saying things like, I was actually excited to go to school. Um, we picked the quotes here, by the way, um, not because they were like extreme quotes, but because they represented um, themes and, and that they were many quotes that spoke to these same issues. Uh, I didn't have any stress or competition. Um, I want to use this opportunity to also point out that a lot of these quotes the kids gave us were very revealing, not about J-term necessarily, but about how they viewed school. Right. And I think that that's a really interesting piece for teachers and administrators to learn from this process about um, kind of how tough it is for kids in terms of their feeling of the competition or the external pressures in regular school. Another theme that uh, students enjoyed the change from a traditional structure. Again, in this case, it was um, six and a half hours in one class as opposed to seven classes for 47 minutes. It didn't feel like a normal day. Uh, we heard a lot of this about the schedule and people not noticing time. Another, another theme that students enjoyed, um, self-direction. A lot of teachers took the freedom of the schedule to give kids more um, opportunity to direct their learning. Um, and students, sorry, students uh, clearly noticed that. Um, it was made clear to them, but they also um, I think very much were aware and appreciated the freedom that they had during J-Term. Another theme, students showed a preference for courses included off-site travel. So this was a very common theme for, for some classes that didn't travel. They would look at their peers and look at the Instagram pictures and see what their friends were doing, and there was certainly some jealousy. Yeah. Um, I think as it relates to budget, one of my, um, I, don't know, I wouldn't say concerns, but maybe like predictions is that Teachers are well aware that, um, that this was very popular, the off-site learning. And I think there are some teachers who didn't do a lot of off-site learning that, that are going to want to do trips. And trips are, uh, of course, potentially expensive. Uh, another theme, students experienced the end of the school year prior to J-term, the end of term four of the final exams, as more stressful. So this is not a positive, um, that the rush, or the time up to J-term felt rushed for many students. We heard that across the board, nearly across the board. Um, this student is identifying that they felt like the time was tough on teachers because there were five less days. Factually, it was actually three less days because we did alter the final exam schedule so that we didn't want to take five full days away from teachers. But having said that, um, there's no doubt that a lot of kids felt like they had a lot of projects and final exams and end of term assignments that were all coinciding in the days leading up to J-term. And that was very stressful for a lot of students. And as we'll find out in a second, stressful for uh, teachers as well. Um, also, we found out that kids wanted to learn more about other JTERM courses. The Instagram feed was really popular, and so we want to do more in this coming year to make the courses connected so that kids have an opportunity to experience other courses um, and interact with kids in other courses. Uh, one more thing, or a couple more themes possibly. The students were able to articulate specific learning outcomes. So just to highlight a few pieces here, I'll put them all up here, um, just from different courses. Um, that kids were really saying some insightful things about what they came away with in this process. And in some cases, they were like experiential things about being with um, peers in different grades and different levels who they weren't used to um, being with. But in some cases, it was very specific things, like the pursuit of happiness, the third one here, that they learned to meditate and do yoga, and that they're planning on incorporating that into their regular um, kind of schedule. Um, this last quote here uh, from Summit New England Peaks, I took away that even when things get really difficult, you can figure it out by taking a step back, staying calm, and having a positive attitude. The social-emotional 
progress that kids made during J-term was awesome. Um, in a way, it's, it is reflective of a lot of the struggles that they're going through in regular school, but a lot of students reflected in their comments just about um, ways that they grew as a person in terms of their character, um, and that was great to see. So for teachers, the feedback we got from teachers quantitatively, we asked them the same question about whether we thought, uh, whether they thought J-Term fulfilled the mission. And again, the vast majority of teachers um, said yes, it did. So um, about 85% uh, or 86% of teachers saying um, that it fulfilled the mission we were setting out to create. Uh, and finally, um, this question about whether or not the, all the work they had done in professional development for J-Term was that applicable beyond the classroom. And about half the teachers said yes, another 36% said maybe. Um, so while we'd like to see that yes number higher, I think, um, first of all, there might be some ways in which teachers may not realize the effect that it had, but I would still argue that to have uh, probably about 40 to 50 teachers be able to articulate that this was something in professional development that has had a real positive impact on their teaching, we don't often see that kind of feedback from professional development programs. Um, just to highlight some of the quality of feedback from teachers, I think this was the biggest takeaway. There was a lot of nervousness going into this, dating back to the time that Emily first introduced it in the spring of 2016, where teachers felt like, if I don't have grades, how are kids going to show up? Why are they going to show up? And um, teachers, I think, were really impressed with kids' motivation. I think it was really revealing for them to see that when you take away grades, when you take away a lot of those extrinsic pressures, um, you still have kids that are highly motivated because they want to learn, they want to know more about stuff, um, they want to have really authentic experiences. Um, and we don't get a chance to always do that in schools, and so this, I think, was really great for teachers to be able to experience that. I see a couple of quotes here that speak to the same point. Uh, another theme for teachers is the structure allowed them to um, develop more meaningful relationships. This, again, speaks to the social-emotional piece for students. Um, we got a lot of this about ways that you get to know your kids far deeper than you're spending six, seven hours with for five days. Um, I commented to Emily the, the, the other day that you know, having taught a teacher in course myself, when I walk down the hall, if I see a student who I had in my course, so there's that kind of special little, like, hey, like we had a, a solid week together. Um, and that's really, I think, a unique thing where you know we see typically students for 47 minutes a day, and it's really hard to develop those relationships. Uh, many teachers made connections about how J-Term could impact their thinking about their regular teaching. So there's a lot of quotes here that speak to that. Things about building a classroom community. Um, things about involving students in the learning process, self-directed learning, student-centered learning, and also about flexibility. I think the, the classes and the teachers who were most successful were the ones who were able to adjust on the fly, to adjust the kids' feedback. Um, I think that's a valuable lesson for, for teachers in any classroom setting to be able to listen to what kids are saying about their experiences and make adjustments accordingly. Uh, I'll just highlight that last piece there. Again, I think it got me to think about the pressures students put on themselves to perform and do well. I knew it was always there, but I didn't know the extent. Again, that was really common for me. Um, this uh, piece about the end of the term being stressful was also too for, true for teachers. Um, I think in part, actually, the stress that teachers experienced getting grades and, and finals all wrapped up may have, in fact, and probably likely played a part in kids' anxiety, I think. Um, you know, I think teachers would probably acknowledge that um, one of the experiences we learned from this is to maybe um, be able to kind of model the composure of being able to kind of um, handle all these pressures, although they certainly were many pressures, so that kids aren't feeling what adults are feeling. Um, there are steps, by the way, that we're taking to address that, which I'll speak to in just a minute. Uh, Co-teaching, we almost never get to do this in our regular teaching, so um, a lot of teachers commented on how valuable that was to be able to work with a colleague and learn from a colleague. Um, and that's, again, a really valuable professional tool. Uh, parent feedback, finally, we're, we're almost wrapping up. Um, we got a lot of unsolicited emails. Um, Emily and Sean received a lot of emails from parents that just spoke to what a really positive experience this was for their kids. Um, they said things like you know, that their son or daughter was really um, looking forward to showing up at school that maybe for this kid that wasn't a normal thing for them. Um, this parent noted that this is the end of June and kids are still excited to be learning. This idea of taking risks, trying new experiences. Um, parents did recognize that this was a big endeavor, but they um, were pretty universal in their, in their feedback. But they supplied to us in saying that um, it was worth it. Okay, so, um, 
to wrap up here, some themes uh, and the impact, again, not just in those five days. For teachers, I think a lot of them came away with these lessons about student engagement, um, the professional culture of working with colleagues throughout the process and then in their courses, uh, the experience of developing curriculum. Um, this was, in some cases, new for some teachers, to work on their creative thinking, to wrap courses around essential questions, um, to use various met methods of instructions, which was required when you teach a six and a half hour day, you, you have to mix it up, and so there's a lot of value in teachers learning how to do that in their regular practice. And then the added emphasis that this place on student relationships, I think has been very positive in the social emotional benefits. Uh, for students, um, the detachment of learning experiences from grades. I, I would say that when we first ran focus groups with kids, um, I remember being in classrooms where the students could not conceive of learning being something that could happen without the grades. It was like, well, we can do fun things or we can learn. Um, and it was actually, it was somewhat depressing to, to um, be part of that conversation, but I think a big benefit here is that kids um, did talk about these experiences as a learning experience, even though there weren't any extrinsic motivators. Um, the interaction with kids that they've never been in classes before, um, the positive affiliations about school, the confidence, the increased ability and opportunities to direct their own learning, um, and the improvement, like I talked about earlier, in their social emotional skills. Um, there are shifted relationships with teachers so that they might now be in a math class with the teacher they spent the whole week detailing colors with in one of our courses, um, where they start to see their, their teacher in a different way and that teacher sees them differently. Uh, finally, our, our steps looking forward. Um, continued progress this year, things we've already done. This summer we had um, three steering committee sub -meet, uh, subgroup meetings. Uh, we looked at the qualitative feedback from kids, so there's quite a lot to look at. Um, this was to speak to a point that uh, Charlie had made several times in our um, steering committee meetings is to have some way to document what this process looked like. So uh, one of our subcommittees created a J-term summary document, um, which is a pretty lengthy uh, kind of explanation of this entire process. Um, that's something that we could potentially, um, and already have actually presented to other schools. Uh, an initial plan for new courses, how to distribute teachers to those courses. Another piece that's happened this year, Sean and I met with um, Concord Carlisle. They also piloted a very similar program last year. They called it Q5. Um, Weston High School also piloted a similar program. Um, we intended to meet with Weston as well, but um, they couldn't make it that day, so we had a very productive meeting with the um, principal and one of the assistant principals at Concord Carlisle, shared a lot of our experiences. A lot was similar, some was different. Um, and we continue to, uh, we plan on continuing that relationship with them to kind of talk about the planning process. Um, we've had one professional development session already uh, this year um, to reflect back on last year, teaching and learning um, and what we learned, and also to um, generate the new courses, which I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, we've continued to seek out other sources of funding, so we applied for a grant from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. We're still awaiting to hear on that grant. Um, it's not um, a huge chunk of the money, but it certainly is something that would help. Uh, we've had a steering committee meeting already to look at new course proposals, um, and we've met with the teachers of those proposed courses to talk about the feedback that the steering committee had. Um, our next step, which you'll see in a minute, is to run student focus groups about those courses. I highlighted this earlier, but these are the courses we do not anticipate running this year. I want to um, also note one of these courses, Destination Aviation, which was a phenomenal course. The reason that's not running is that um, the chief teacher in that was um, Chris Pareda, who is actually not a Westwood staff member. He is the husband of our longtime and now retired school nurse, Karen Greta. Um, and Chris was a certified uh, pilot and gave the kids tremendous access to things that they could never get access to, things like the um, control tower at Logan Airport. Uh, it was a phenomenal course, but unfortunately without Chris, that course just can't happen. Um, the proposed new courses. So uh, I think it's, it's not likely that every one of these courses is going to run, um, but I do think it's likely that the majority of what you see here will. So if you're wondering about the first one, that is a Harry Potter-themed course. <laughs> um, some other courses here, um, we're really happy with um, the fact that a couple of these courses speak to specific student minority groups, um, whether it's um, the Asian film course or the black music course. Um, we think that's really important to, to offer curriculum that um, speaks to all different kinds of kids. Um, you can see some of these other courses here, um, like I said, the Urban Walking, which is kind of the newest version of the Boston Foodies course. This, I believe, is our last slide, so I apologize for the length of this presentation, but we're wrapping up. Um, so the lessons learned changes for this year. Uh, we clearly need to address how the end of the year felt for teachers and students, and we've already made changes to that effect. So um, we've redistributed the days of all the terms already so that um, 
fourth term is longer than it was last year. Fourth term really got um, truncated in a way that was potentially stressful. So we've changed the calendar. Um, we'll be asking teachers not to um, have major projects and assignments due the last week of the fourth term right before final exams as well. To have earlier due dates, to stagger those with other departments so that kids are not all doing you know, three or four projects and final exams at the same time. Um, we want to create new opportunities for courses to interact with one another. Uh, we want to restructure the courses to speak to your point earlier um, about courses that needed more variety in their structure that clearly kids um, you know, weren't as excited about. Um, there are administrative changes about how we utilize office staff in terms of the ordering of equipment, which is a massive um, endeavor. I want to give a um, shout out to Carol Morris and Joyce, who the vast majority of the ordering of equipment um, and, and budget, which was, I think, a, a monumental task. Um, so that's the equipment ordering and also the course uh, change process for the kids who wanted to um, change their course. We were able to accommodate most kids who wanted to do that. And I would say that that is credit to Sean, who fielded probably 50 or 60 emails from kids and parents. Um, and responded to each of them in, in the best way he could. So we do need to change that process so that Sean isn't um, getting that number of emails again. Well, I've never met <laughs> <laughs> And so these are our next steps. Um, student focus groups on the courses that we're proposing, we want to get kids feedback. Um, we need to update the website. We'll do one day of J-Term shopping this year. We'll still give kids the opportunity to shop six courses. And then they'll register um, right before the winter break. They'll be notified of their course placement sometime towards the end of January, and the tentative schedule right now, um, the last five days of school, four and a half days, we put J-Term 2019 as June 11th to the 17th, subject to some days in which case it will be like that. Um, so, that will take any questions. I don't know if thank you for sitting through that lengthy presentation. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Are we yeah. going to be able to participate in that? Yeah. <laughs> The teacher has the same question. They want to take each other's courses. Yeah. I had the chance to sit on maybe half a dozen of the committee meetings. And yeah. The only criticisms I heard were the seniors wanted to come back and take the courses. Yeah. Yeah. And the parents wanted to take the classes. Yeah. Yeah. That was the other thing. Uh, I, I also want to thank Emily. Was, she had this idea. And yeah. I think people at first said, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah. I mean, and the teachers bought right in. Uh, it was just as a, a wonderful innovative idea that she started and, and it deserves an awful lot of credit for pushing it initially until suddenly people said this could be a wonderful thing. The, uh, the, so sitting with the committee, uh, uh, it's like uh, being in a startup company over on Kendall Square with this idea and it, I mean suddenly the brilliance of these teachers, I mean the comments they had, the suggestions, I mean it's a really a highly talented group of people who are innovators. You know, so every one of these courses, never mind bus trips, and, I mean, it was a wonderful experience and we should be very it's fortunate the talent that we have, and Jonas did a wonderful job at you know, keeping the meetings going and answering all of these questions, and to get just not the teachers to buy in, but the kids to buy in. To, you know, for you know, 700 kids, it's a, it's a huge, so it was a tremendous uh, effort on the part, and I think as a school committee, and just to thank you and all the teachers to, to do this. And then this evaluation process, I mean, he, he, he got, began to get into it, but a real effort was made to ask the kids and the teachers for their feedback and the parents, what can we learn? If he cut something back, get some news. So that, that's a whole wonderful, and then it's, it's great to reach out to other towns to see what ideas they might have, what, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah. To, and, and as was said, I don't think there's, you know, 10 public schools in the country that are even attempting something like this and forget most private schools would never do it. So it's really a unique thing Westwood should be very proud of. And thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. Yeah, and I just do want to say, I mean, Dick Price is sitting here tonight and listening to all this. It is a remarkable, remarkable thing that the high school faculty made this happen. And it could not have happened if they didn't all hop on board, get excited, and say, let's Let's do it. I really appreciate that. And when I first pitched it, I was the assistant superintendent and didn't know that I'd be changing roles. So I sort of moved into a new office and said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jonas really did a lot of heavy lifting, and Allison suddenly found out that she had a big project. <laughs> and the high school administration, and, you know, all um, three high school administrators were on the steering committee. That steering committee did a tremendous amount of work, and it was all voluntary. Um, and the finished product. You know, I, I shopped in one of yeah, the days. Came to the I, final exhibition. I mean, it was so professional. So professional. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks so much. Thank you. Great work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Your priorities. Um, I thought that I would just say a couple of things in preface to our um, budget discussion. So we said that tonight we would have an initial discussion about things that the school committee would like to see as priorities in the budget development process. Um, so we already talked about class sizes, so there was sort of a backdrop of some information there. I also want to talk about turnover. So just as I did this time last year, I want to be clear about how we've used our turnover money this year. So you know, to remind people in all school budgets from year to year, between when the budget is established and voted on and when school opens in September, there are changes in personnel, right, due to retirements or resignations. And when staff leaves, we're sometimes, but not always, able to hire people who are at a lower salary step than the people who were departing. Um, you know, this notably also works in the other direction. Sometimes we hire people based on the market or the candidates we have who have a higher salary than what was budgeted. Um, but the net difference of those variables is what we refer to as turnover in the budget. Um, and since school budgets are voted as a bottom line number, the turnover provides us some important flexibility when unanticipated needs arise. So this year, we have added several positions within that bottom line number that were unanticipated at the time of the budget. One of them we already talked about. So you may recall that last, um, last spring, during the budget process, we decided that we would add a teacher at Martha Jones but we said, we'll do that within the bottom line number. We'll take it out of turnover. So that's what we did. We've also had um, some staffing needs in special education that either were related to the changes in kids, um, the needs on kids' IEPs, or in some cases because we've had kids arrive in the district who we didn't know about during the budget process last year. So um, we have hired a part-time BCBA a board certified behavior analyst. We have about six and a half instructional assistants, a part time ABA tutor, part time OT, and part time speech. This is all at the middle? All related to needs related to kids' IEPs. Um, so those are some significant additions that we've used our turnover money. We've used our turnover money at this point. And so I mention this because these positions will need to be incorporated into the base in order to continue to have them next year. So when we calculate the budget increase necessary for level of services, we would incorporate those positions in. I do want to emphasize that in the budgeting process, we always evaluate our staffing needs in special education and gen ed from zero. So it may be that when we start going through that analysis, we in fact decide some of the people we don't need um, or some other people we don't need. Um, so, you know, we do that and, and we always look for ways to reallocate within the district. So, you know, last year, for instance, we reduced some teaching staff in elementary and then we just moved it to the high school. So we will still be doing that, that process, but um, I just wanted to be transparent about how the turnover money had been used. Also just want to remind you that this is the final year of the teacher's contract and we'll be going into collective bargaining this winter and spring, so you know, presumably there will be some percentage increase that comes out of that process, but that is an unknown variable at this point. And then just a reminder that during last year's budget process, we introduced a plan to eliminate the kindergarten tuition. We cut it in half this year, and according to that plan, the tuition would be reduced to zero next year though it will take two more years to gradually reduce the tuition offset. So the plan we had is to um, phase out the offset by $85,000 a year. We reduced the offset last year by, this year for 85 k We would need to do that again next year and the year after. As part of that plan. So those are sort of things that are already in the mix. So. Any uh, suggestions, ideas, school committee members have for other issues that might be considered for the budget? So I think the, the extent we can start investing in those curriculum direct, I don't call it the middle school. Mm -hmm. I think that was, at least for me, 
that's important. Um, I know it may take time, but um, that seems to be what we talked about last meeting. The curriculum leaders. Yeah, curriculum leaders yeah. that we call them. Yeah, I'll second that. And the other thing I'd just like to double click on, or maybe an explanation, uh, this is in the other way. Mm -hmm. I may be saying, so if you look at the specials, the, in the elementary school, yeah. I think we're at like 4.6 for librarians and like 3.6, 3.8 for some of the other specials. I'm just asking a question. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand that maybe at Deerfield you don't need full time special, but I, just, mm -hmm. I want to understand why that's the case. There might be opportunities. Mm -hmm. Just look at that for the specials. Okay. Yeah, we all okay. I have a couple of concerns that you've heard before, but one is the, uh, we've done an incredible job introducing the coding into the third grade mm -hmm. and beginning to think through the fourth and fifth grade continuation of the kids were all pumped up. We had feedback where kids were coming into school sick because they didn't want to miss their coding day. You know, and, and, I, and I think just to begin to think through how we might begin to fill in the uh, fourth and fifth grade as they then get to this beautiful STEM high school program. The other one that's always been of concern to me is how wonderful we do with the category in the MCAS for the students with learning needs. They have different disabilities, they call it different things, and yeah. we do a terrific job with English and math, but the whole the science issue seems, and I think we were thinking of looking at what other towns maybe have done well, you know, so could we look at see if somebody figured out something innovative by the towns that have done, you know, where those those kids that are right up there, five or ten percent different from the, you know, and it's more just to explore it to see who's doing what that might might help us, because that always has been a uh, although we do a terrific job with that group for math and uh, uh, and uh, in English, I think that those would be two things I'd just like to look into. Anything else? Thank you again for all the homework you've done and putting this together and uh, uh, giving us feedback on what we need to be looking at. I will just mention J Jim since we have spent a lot of time talking yeah. about it. So, um, you know, we now have a much better grasp on what the cost of J term is. I mean, as we were literally sort of building it slightly, we weren't sure how that was going to work out. And, um, you know, we have, I think it's $25,000 in the budget. J term, but the cost seems to be more of the 42. Can we, can can we, we not reapply to, <laughs> to <laughs> Foundation for Western <laughs> Education? I mean, I just, I don't think they can. We have them in hand. I don't think they can sustain that. They can't? Why not? So, I mean, I mean they, they've been clear in the past that their mission is really as a startup of a, a program like this that then the, the school system well, would adopt. Tweak it. Would we be um, <clears throat> willing to go outside and look? Oh, great. Well, Joe, sponsors. It might be something I can help with. Yeah. So I'm always happy to go outside and look. I, um, yeah, happy to do that. And we've already applied for, um, you know, the grant. But it's not very much. Yeah, I mean, we. Um, so we're at, what did you say you have right now? 25. And we need, let's say, roughly no, five, right? I don't know, like 20. 20. Just 20? Because in the <laughs> well, trips, that's what I was going to say right. is that you had classes last mm -hmm. time that were in the school mm -hmm. that didn't go over quite as well. Yeah. So you're going to have more travel <coughs> and, yeah. and uh, maybe more that's experience. Well, yeah. more is better in the sense that it gives us you know more flexibility. But um, yeah, I mean, we also have talked on the steering committee about the fact that we may have to have some conversations with people what courses and what's possible, what's not financially. So, um, so if we could get. Um, or five institutions to end up for our grant. Yeah. Also, if we do what we did this year to ask if you're going to do the scuba diving certification, yeah. did you pay 200 bucks because it required you know a lot of extra. And so the one option is to you know if there's transportation, maybe ask could you you know contribute okay. 10 bucks for the train. If, if you you said it was 67 dollars per pupil. Yeah. I mean, at some point we maybe have to yeah. say. $57. It's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things that we were working on for Carlisle, which their program actually cost more than ours, but um, uh, it was longer. They, um, yeah, they're talking about going in that direction. I think mean, it's okay. We have really, I would, I would like to avoid that if we can. It feels to me like if we're saying, look, this program is related 
to our strategic priorities around meaningful learning experiences, kids' social and emotional wellness, right? That you need to pay for it. Yeah, <laughs> that you need to pay for it. So every year it will go up. Yeah, and so to me, this feels like if if we think that there's value in the program, which I believe there is. Um, then we should think about a way that we can pay for it. And this is a public education. If, if we can't pay for it, then I would, I would, I would be opposed to having kids pay for it. Yeah. Another approach we could use to put this up I mean, to the committee would be to, as we're doing this in the city, let's try to say, you know, parents who are willing to make a contribution, you know, yeah. we're not charging the sure. kids, but if somebody wants to pay a hundred bucks, you know, invite parents if they'd like to contribute. The other thing is, I think there's so many innovative things being done here. Uh, I've always felt there's a lot of people out there in the community yeah. who aren't working full time, but they know how to write proposals, they know how to write things. And, and if, if we could write grants to get funding, you know, national educational institutions would love to have somebody write up what we just heard today to share that with the country. You know, so there's a lot of if we could write grants beyond our local, you know, for other things that we're doing here. The, the uh, student independent study thing, all of these innovative things that maybe somebody's willing to fund to have us educate others on how we did it. I think there's all, so if we could fi maybe find a, a grant writing group that would be volunteers just as they volunteer for the PTO, just to help us. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Grants and fundraisers and corporate donors. Yeah. And I'm, I'd be happy to. He just said, however, we do a car wash. That's it. Car wash? It's a good idea. School committee wash. Everybody drives the school committee wash the cars. But it would have to be a brushless, touchless. This is a, you know. Okay, would you be willing to be, look into getting a I would be happy to start the, getting the donations going on this. Right. I'm convinced if you ask some of the. I know Dan would be happy to. I know that there's a camera going too. Yes. I, I would say that I'm sure the corporate be, side, I'm sure there's a lot of people love to be. I mean, all, they've been great. Yeah, they have yeah. been great. So I think we can go in that direction. I, I mean, and, and I'm happy to do that. I've just been making, I think, a larger philosophical point about if we say that this is something that we want to incorporate into the program. I mean, we did a pilot. We got a lot of feedback. We're able to assess the value of the program. I think we concluded it was really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, what is the value? of that, literally, right. and I think we need to think about that. Um, I think it's but, also worth talking to the Foundation for Western Education, because if this, if, I, do I mean, I just, even if they're not gonna give us the full 20 again, mm -hmm. they, they should do something, right? right? Because this is the whole purpose of the Foundation. Turn to the camera. This is the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this is, I think this is such an amazing yeah. program that, has Jonas made a presentation to them? So we haven't done this presentation to them, and I feel like I, I should mean, say that's one meeting of this twenty. They yeah. they took a big big risk right. on this because we were like, here is a piece of paper where we're telling you what we want to do, and they gave us twenty grand, so that was really fantastic. What about at our last long range planning meeting? Yeah. Remember they were talking about meal steps, mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. And giving some of it to the school. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And um, I said at the time, Jason, don't remember. Mm -hmm. So why don't we hit them up? Mm -hmm. Okay. Adam from Westwood Media Center. I'm going to put you on the spot, but would it be possible to get like a CD made of that presentation that we wouldn't have to get poor Jonas out there doing it, but we could give it to people to look at. You know, Can is I that a possibility? You gotta ask Westwood Media. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk to them. It's on film now, so there it is. We're gonna have so much money. We don't know what to say. I would like to Joseph has to get out of here to the Bruins game tonight and the Celtics. She's got two games tonight, so I promised her we move along here quickly. You want the Celtics? No. I can't say 30. I'm going uh, Action items. Ready for action? Do we wrap it up on budget? Is there anything else? Yeah, do the action items. Go ahead. Uh, action. Yeah, okay. Approval of the minutes. I, do I, have a, a I just want to make one modification. On, on page six, Kendra, when I talked about the uh, well, thing about the high school. Kendra. Kendra. Uh, oh, I, well, can you just mention that I want that at a school committee meeting? Add that amendment. What he said it was. At page six. Where? Page six? On the minutes. Yeah. When I said I commented that I wanted, would like to hear about the budget process. After the budget process, I want to hear about the middle school. Yeah. I just maybe note that I want to hear at a school meeting. Yeah. 
about that. The motion to approve the adjustment here. Motion made. Second. Uh, second. Yep. Okay. Now for the whole uh, approval of the minutes. Oh, I think you we have to vote on that. Who approves the amendment? Okay. Next. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of October 9th. Second. Right here is the vote. No. Approved everybody. Okay. The next one is the overnight uh, trip to the girls' varsity hockey team to Boston, Mass. Okay. Motion right. to approve. Second. Any vote? Right. New business, I'd just like to mention that the uh, there is t this uh, Saturday at the Wally celebration at Westwood High, an Indian celebration, and Sean is a speaker welcoming yep. the Indian community to Westwood High for it. So thank you for participating in yeah, that. Yeah, that's great. Great event. You've never been to it. You've not been to it. Really. Women arriving get a free sari to wear. Oh. And, uh, wonderful Indian music, food, uh, celebration. So just thank you for participating yeah. in that. Um, can I just add one second? Yep. Um, so the play this weekend, um, I was. Um, t it's a tough play. Is it? So the high school play was 1984, and um, not a light piece, dark, and and uh, but a tremendous, tremendous production. I thought I'm always impressed. And it's one of my greatest days, well, what do we do, two plays a year, that I get to walk across the street and think I'm all that, going to theater <laughs> <laughs> in Westwood with my husband. It's a date night, and we, we enjoy the theater here tremendously. And that's a tough piece to do, and these kids were exceptional, as they always are. So a big shout out to them um, for a, a fine production of, again, a very tough piece. So, right? Thanks, Carl, I'll share that one. Thank you. Any other new information or additional discussion? Do I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting? So yes. moved. Second. 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 Second.